Welcome everybody in the chat today. We are doing something really fun. A lot of people ask me, hey Daniel, which video, uh, video editing software is the right video editing software for what, you know, for creators out there who might be, you know, doing freelance work, might be uh, making videos for YouTube, could be any kind of thing that you might be doing, making videos for Instagram um, <clears throat> and or TikTok nowadays. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to bring one of my friends on, uh, a guy named Jay Lippman, who has a great channel by that name, Jay Lippman, and he's a, a freelance videographer. He, um, he on his channel, he actually talks a lot about how to use DaVinci Resolve uh, to do the kind of things that you might want to do. It's not too different from my channel, showing people the ins and outs of the software. So I thought I'd bring him over here and we'd actually kind of talk about which one of these softwares is better or which one is right for you or which one has more features or which one's easier on your computer. We got a whole list of questions. So without any further, further ado, uh, would you please welcome to the stream uh, my good friend, Mr. Jay Littman. Hey, Jay, how Hello. you doing, pal? <laughs> I'm good, man. How are you? Oh, look at that. People, they love you. The crowd loves you, man. They love you. <laughs> I haven't heard that since I was in a band. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting thing. I know on your channel, Jay, you actually did a video comparing um, Filmora and Da Vinci and kind of went back and forth. Uh, yep. talking about some of the the pros and cons of each and it is it's the I bet you get that question a lot too. Do you get that question a lot on your channel people asking like which one's the right one? Uh I I do. I do. I get a lot and that's actually why I made that video is because I was getting that question a whole lot. Now <laughs> when people ask I can say watch this. Watch that video. <laughs> <laughs> well there's so many questions and I think that sometimes just telling people try the software and see if you like it um can be a little restrictive because um you know, not everybody always, um, not everybody always is, you know, willing to spend that kind of time. They really want, like, in someone who's actually used it, just give me um, some tips as to is this the right one? Is this is this the uh, is this the kind of software that I should that I should invest in? And if it's not, you know, tell me why. So um, this is a nice, easy way to do this. I thought we would kind of walk through some of it. <clears throat> um, can you quickly tell people, I've done a really hack job of introducing you. Can you tell people <laughs> out in the chat room a little bit more about yourself and a little bit about your channel so they can really understand who you are? Yeah, sure. So, uh, hi, I'm Jay, uh, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, I have a YouTube channel. I'm a freelance video editor. I have a channel that is dedicated to video editing. It's kind of split 50, 50, uh, half of it is like Daniel said, DaVinci resolve tutorials where I dive in, uh, and, and really focus on how to actually use the software. So I kind of stay away from like how to do this really cool effect. And it's more like how, uh, take a look at this really cool tool that'll seriously help your workflow and then the other half of it is actually diving into the art of video editing and teaching people how to know where to cut what kind of cut to use stuff like that yeah um that's um that you know that's one of the things that we're definitely going to talk about today is just some of the things that you might want to consider <clears throat> beyond just you know, what are the features of the tool? Because I think sometimes people will naturally lean towards um, which has more features, that's the one for me. But there's actually a lot of things that you have to take into consideration before you make a decision. Because to this day, I still use mostly either Filmora X, sometimes Movavi to do my video editing. And I can use anything. I've got the computers to run the stuff. So there's a reason I stick with some simpler types of video editors. Um, and we'll talk about that. And there's some reasons, Jay, you like using DaVinci Resolve. So mm -hmm. one of the things we're going to start with, um, let me, because I'm a Film Filmora guy, let me quickly talk about Filmora. Um, it's a pretty straightforward um, video editing software. And when I say Filmora, I'm referring to the current version, Filmora 10, or sometimes you'll see it as Filmora X, X being the Roman numeral for 10. So that's the update to Filmora 9. It's a pretty straightforward software that um, that has a, a fairly easy workflow. It's got a lot of built-in uh, push-button features for transitions and things. So if you want to make something happen, um, it it's really is not a real difficult learning curve trying to figure out how to get the software to do the thing that you want it to do. Um, it does have, like any other video editing software, a certain amount of... Um, of uh, minimum system requirements that you want to be aware of. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit, but, um, but it's a pretty straightforward intermediate video editing software that'll kind of get the job done for most of your basic edits. Uh, Jay, can you tell me a little bit about your take on DaVinci Resolve? 
Yeah, sure. So Da Vinci Resolve, uh, uh, based on Daniel's explanation of Filmora, is kind of like the polar opposite. It's <laughs> uh, it, it does have a steeper learning curve, but it, it's a it's an NLE nonlinear editor, which is what all video editing softwares are. Uh, that is geared towards professional like this is going into netflix or into the theater that type of video editing and it's got uh it, it's an all-in-one platform so you can bring your media in you can organize it right in the platform you can do all the editing uh color grading which is what davinci resolve really is known for it used to be only a color grading tool and it wasn't until i think davinci resolve 12 that they started adding in actual video editing elements and uh shortly after that they added in fairlight and fusion and now <clears throat> you can do the editing you can do the color grading you can do the audio and you can do uh compositing or visual effects and uh, so it really isn't all in one thing, but it's a steeper learning curve. It has all the tools that you need, um, but it's built to be fully customizable. So it's not push button. If you want an effect nine times out of 10, you're going to have to build that effect piece by piece in the Fusion page. Yeah. Now it's on what version is Resolve on currently, Jay? Uh, the full version that's out right now is 16. Um, but what DaVinci Resolve does is they'll have the first, the, yeah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> their full version. Uh, and they will, you know, after that's been out for about six months, nine months, something like that, they'll release the beta of the next version. So currently we're on the full version of 16 and the ninth version of 17 beta. Okay. So when you say beta, that means they've released it, you can use it, but it's sort of their acknowledgement that there may be some tweaks and things that they're still finishing up. They're sort of putting it in the hands of users to get some input back about their experience once it's out in, you know, uh, en masse on the, in the population. Exactly. Yeah. They, they release it uh, with, you know, all the brand new tools and they wait for feedback from the forums and all the crash reports and everything so they can really get an idea of what bugs need to be fixed before they can promote it as a full release. Because if you are working in a studio doing professional work, you really don't want to be using the beta version. You want something that's been proven to be stable. And so that's why they release the beta to the masses so they can collect all that data, fix the bugs, and then say, okay, professionals, now you can use it safely. That's awesome. That's a great explanation. I think sometimes people get confused on all these different versions, even in the chat right now. I saw the coach plays was um, asking a very simple question, which is, you know, is there a difference between Filmora X10 or in Filmora? And no, there really, there, there, there isn't. It's, um, all it is is that um, Filmora was always Filmora. It was their original software. They got asked, so, and every and every year or so, they kept updating it. So it started as Filmora Seven was the first thing I used. I think Filmora Eight, then Nine. Now it's Filmora Ten or X. Um, but they had introduced a Filmora Pro because so many people had asked for so many more features that the basic entry entry level intermediate Filmora was just never built to be that kind of video editor. So they made a different version called Filmora Pro that is designed to do more, more of what like DaVinci serves, more of a, more functionality, uh, the ability to do, um, to dig in and do more things. But it's, it's like you said, there aren't all these, it's sort of in between Filmora and DaVinci where it has some preset stuff, but um, but no, most of those like things that people are used to in Filmora, where they just push a button and a transition happens, that just doesn't really exist in Filmora Pro as much. So let me go ahead. Let me interrupt. You. Yeah, I was going to say that's actually an interesting thing that happened with DaVinci Resolve 17. Are there are a lot more? It's not push button, but it is. Uh, there's a lot more drag and drop transitions and effects uh, being created for. Uh, for DaVinci Resolve, like by Blackmagic Design, which is really cool. So the version 17 had a lot more of those effects, a lot more of those really cool custom titles that you would find in something like Filmora. And the great thing is, is you can drag them into your timeline, but then you can also go into the Fusion page and completely customize those effects. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Well, let's, while we're sitting here, one of the first questions I think that always comes up that I have to talk to people about is the system, the minimum system requirements. Now, <clears throat> we'll get deeper into this, but each one of these softwares has a specific set of guidelines that before you try any of them, you want to look at your computer and you want to see, does my computer meet or exceed these minimum system requirements? Because if it doesn't, just because you can download it, 
doesn't mean that it's going to run properly on your on your system. Um, and I think people make that mistake. Like I have a computer, there's software I should download it. It should work. And unfortunately, when it comes to video editing, it's nothing like that. And we're going to get deeper into that. But really quickly, let me pull up the. Um, let me add this over here. So this is the Filmora current version, Filmora 10. Their minimum system requirements. I can go full screen with this. Um, and it says right here, you may need to update your graphics drivers to run Filmora. Please keep your computer graphics drivers updated to get the best performance. Find out how when they go into it. Uh, you have to have anywhere from Windows 7 to Windows 10, but it has to be a 64-bit operating system if you're on PC. Um, with a processor, they want i3 or better, um, 2 gigahertz or above. Um, but they really are pushing towards, if you want to do HD, you need a sixth generation newer Intel, which is like a, you know, I really think an i5 or, or higher um, with a newer gen is going to do much better for you. When it comes to RAM, they minimum four gigabytes to even run the software, eight gigabytes required for HD and 4K videos. We'll laugh about that later. <laughs> um, the Intel Graphics 5000 or later, which is the integrated stuff. Uh, I think personally that you have, you know, it tells you you have to have a GTX 700 or later or an AMD, uh, AMD Radium R5 or later with two gigabytes of VRAM. I think graphics cards are make a huge difference. Uh, and it says di disk space. I almost mispronounced that the wrong way. Uh, at least 10 gigabytes free. I'll talk about that later too. And obviously an internet connection that would allow you to use the software and upload you know your videos to um to uh youtube if you're going to do that now over here we can talk about davinci resolve now let me see if i can get a little bit closer on this so it's easier to see um i have to go all the way down jay you taught me this i get a dig right okay now you can see the Mac and the, um, the Windows requirements as well as Linux. That's one difference you should think about. If you are running a Linux system as an operating system, Filmora currently is only available for Windows and Mac, not Linux. So you want that would immediately make a decision of which one you might want to um, which one you might want to choose. Uh, for the minimum system requirements for Windows, I'm a PC user, so is Jay. We're going to tell you that you know they want Windows 10 cre uh, at least. So it's not seven, eight, nine. You're going to have issues running it on that. You want 16 gigabytes of system memory, 32 when using Fusion. So right out of the gate, they're asking for higher minimum system requirements to run the software. Um, they want a couple of different things, including an integrated GPU or discrete GP, uh, GPU with two gigabytes of VRAM. Um, and they also has to have a GPU which supports the OpenCL or the CUDA, CUDA 11. Um, the, uh, they, they actually go down and list all of the different driver versions you would need um, and the NVIDIA driver versions that are recommended to even start using this software. Um, when we talk about these, these things, <laughs> Jay, I'm going to stay here for a minute. Minimum system requirements. What is your take on minimum system requirements? And if people should look at those and go, I have that exact system. I'm going to download it and run the software. What do you, what's your take? Okay. So you know how in, uh, in all system requirements lists, uh, after it gives you something, it either says or more or, or later or, or greater. You always want to go for the or more or later or greater because just because you can run something that is the minimum the those are the minimum system requirements that the manufacturer the builder of the software has said like okay if you have this it will be stable it won't blow anything up it won't make your computer crash it won't do all like that's what they're saying they are not saying that you're going to have a good experience actually using the software i mean i used well, I mean, I've used computers when I first started with DaVinci Resolve, my computer that I had was actually lower than the minimum system requirements and I could use it. It worked. Uh, it didn't work great, but it worked. And then I had one that was basically on par with the minimum system requirements and that worked a little bit better. But again, you had lagging. Uh, it, it, everything was slow. Render times were atrocious. And, uh, and now I have a custom PC that exceeds those minimum system requirements and I'm working better. So basically the better your computer is, the better it's going to run. Those system requirements are like, it, 
if you have this, you'll at least be able to open the software and it's not going to like cause damage. Right. And it really is that it kind of just shows you like, yes, the features will pull up, they will be accessible and they will operate. But one of the things I always talk to creators about is you know, how many things you're, how many things are you layering into your project? Some people are literally bringing in a piece of video footage, cutting it down, uh, putting in a little bit of text overlays and just tweaking the audio and they're good to go. And so people like that go, you know, Hey, this software runs great for me. But then you go to some other users who are really stacking, you know, high definition 4K um, video pieces in there with multiple, multiple layers. And that's what, and then they start using things like chroma key and they start using effects and transitions to spin it and twist it. And then the, the more they're asking their, their computer to do and the software to do, the more the system struggles to keep up because even the minimum system requirements are, I don't think in any way, shape or form on, at least for Filmora, are going to give you a really good experience for um for like a really a, an, an, a decent edit something that has multiple tracks you know multiple audio multiple video probably going to go into you know for you know up as much as 4k my system still struggles with not struggles but everything slows down with 4k when i bring in all 4k footage it's not that it's struggling but it just takes the the software in the system so much longer to interpret that super deep and detailed data of each piece of video content that it's like it's just in terms of how much data is in that file it's monstrous so anytime the software has to do something with it if the color corrected or do any of that it just struggles that's why we have things in filmora like the um, gpu acceleration uh and mm -hmm. the render feature that allows you to kind of it's almost like applying the effect to the piece of footage um, before you've actually exported it. So it's not forced to keep running through each of these processes ahead of time. And proxy files, does, I'm sure, does DaVinci allow you to run with proxy files? I'm a must. Oh yeah, oh yeah, proxy files are a thing. They call it, uh, they call it optimized media in, in DaVinci Resolve, but it's the same thing. It's creating, and it's not even necessarily the resolution. The big factor with this footage um, is the compression. Uh, that that's the the huge thing with that's going to make your videos lag. If you have highly compressed footage, so if you have 4K H.264, which is what most cameras shoot H.264, so you're looking at 1080 or 4K, that's a pretty compressed file, and the software has to go through and interpret all that data, that compressed data. If you actually bring in footage that is less compressed, for example, my camera shoots 6K raw, but because it's raw, it's a lot less compression. It actually works like a dream in DaVinci Resolve because it takes a lot less time to interpret that data. Um, so it's really the compression that is making software lag more than it is the resolution. Resolution definitely has something to do with it. And whether or not you have GPU acceleration on is a huge, huge factor. That's a great tip about the compression. I don't think anyone ever thinks about the type, literally the properties of their files as they, um, as they bring them in, they just bring video in and they go, all video is video, all audio is audio. And let's just, it, I should have the same cookie cutter experience as everybody else. If I'm, if I'm using a software that they're using, and it's very different than that for a lot of reasons. So that was great to put out. Now let's talk about this. Let's start here. If you had in front of you, um, the choice to make between like a Filmora 10 and a DaVinci Resolve, there are probably some factors that you would want to consider to help you make the decision. Um, part of it would be features and things, but let's start from the top here, Jay. What about, what about cost? What do you think about what's the cost right now of DaVinci Resolve? So DaVinci Resolve has two different versions. Uh, they have DaVinci Resolve and DaVinci Resolve Studio. DaVinci Resolve is free. It's, that, that's it. It's just, it's free. There's no watermark or anything. And it gives you basically everything you would need to create a really good looking video. The only thing that it's missing, well, there's a few things that it's missing, but the notable thing that it's missing are the GPU accelerated effects, GPU accelerated rendering. Uh, so you're missing out the GPU acceleration. You're going to have harder times. You're not going to be able to use uh, a, a good number of the effects and you're going to have uh, longer rendering times. Um, and then DaVinci Resolve Studio is $299, and that is a, a lifetime license. So you buy that, and you just get upgrades for free for however long or until Blackmagic Design changes their mind on that. But, you know, I bought, I bought in at 
DaVinci Resolve 16, I'm getting 17 for free, I'm getting 18 for free, 19, and so on and so forth. And that's gonna give you GPU acceleration. It's gonna give you more options for uh, resolutions. Actually, you can go, I think you can go up to UHD uh, in DaVinci Resolve free. You can go all the way up to an 8K resolution or 6K resolution uh, in DaVinci Resolve Studio. Uh, it gives you a lot more options for rendering your different formats and stuff like that. And then, like I said, GPU accelerated effects and, uh, and GPU accelerated rendering. Nice. Yeah, and uh, a similar thing when it comes to um, Filmora 10, um, any Filmora license you buy, I think they have a couple different tiers where they have a, you know, you can pay by the year, um, which is not that much more cost effective than buying a lifetime individual license. Um, their licensing plans are a little hard to decipher sometimes because they also offer a business plan. The business plan being if you worked in an office and you wanted to buy the software and you knew that five employees were all going to use it simultaneously, you would buy a business plan so that they could all function on it because individually I have so I have Filmora loaded onto a couple different systems, but I can only export on one at a time. I have to be signed in from one machine. So I can only run one instance of Filmora, but street price is about, you know, they say 69 or so. If you go to that Filmora has a .com site and a .net site, the .NET site, they tend to not upgrade as much, and it actually has like a 20% off. You can get it for yeah, maybe a $60 street price. So price comparison, if you wanted to unlock all the features in DaVinci and all the features in Filmora, um, you'd be able to use DaVinci today, a free version without watermark. You cannot do that with Filmora. You have to, their trial version has a watermark on export, and it's just so you can test it out to see if you like it. But if you want to be able to export without a watermark, you actually have to buy a license. Like I said, licenses, but I think the individual lifetime license covers, I bought mine back at like Filmora 8. It's dead, it's applied to all of the new updates, so that's great. So I think I'd pay the same thing, maybe 40 or 50 or $60 somewhere in there at the time. Uh, and it's and it's applied every time they come out with a new one. I just go down, I download it, I log in. There I go. There it is, right there. Um, so okay, that tells us a little bit about cost. If you were thinking about that, um, what about we talked a little bit about that system specs earlier? So that would be a big one, right? The price of it. You'd want to think about what kind of system you're running. Okay. Um, I will after this video is done. I will make sure that the links to the uh, system specs to each different type for Filmora 10 and for DaVinci Resolve are in the description. But as we were talking about earlier, that's just a gateway. That's just a, that gets you into the amusement park. That doesn't mean you get to ride all the big boy rides. <laughs> so think about that as a, as a factor when you're trying to decide what might be the right software for you, because DaVinci is going to need a little bit more than Filmora 10 does currently. Um, but the, it does depend on the system you have. So think about the system you have. Um, another thing like this, uh, Jay, editing requirements, things that people might be using the software for. You want to jump on that? Why would that change the kind of software you might be using or thinking about buying? Well, uh, I mean, there's so many factors. Like, first of all, what kind of footage are you putting in there? What kind, not only what resolution, but also what type of footage? What type of footage does your camera shoot? Does your does the software you're looking at support that type of footage? That is a that is a, a huge deal. So you want to look at the resolution that you're going to be working with. You want to look at the, uh, the container or codec that you're working with, because if the one software supports it and the other one doesn't, doesn't, uh, then that kind of helps you make your decision. For example, Filmora does not support Blackmagic RAW, but DaVinci Resolve does. So I'm using DaVinci Resolve. Um, also, things like effects, edits, layers, transitions, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, one, how much control do you want over that stuff? Do you want just a push button solution where you, you know, drag it onto the timeline or click a button and it's in there and you just kind of get what you get with minimal customization options or do you want to be able to build everything exactly how you want it customize it, uh, it it's all that stuff you know all that stuff it, it's a matter of you know what do you want to do as far as video editing is concerned and does that software support it yeah and that's a big one too like you know people i could see in the stream some of the questions were you know um uh this one here where uh, uh jay and fun was asking um, can we move body parts, things like that. Some softwares, like one thing that people have asked, and there's another question that came through the chat earlier. Thanks for, uh, 
Thanks for the good looking out, Clint. I appreciate it. Where's where um, uh, Seesaw asks, do you think Fillmore will ever update their masking, like keyframing the mask and shift around an object? There's a thing that um, that Fillmore does. It has masking features, but they're preset masks. The question I get a lot is that sort of intelligent masking. Can I cut around a person, remove the background, and then have sort of this person that I can completely change the background? It's a question I get a lot. I would be surprised if we saw that in Filmora 10 or an update anytime soon. Um, it is not the one click um, thing that you think it is. <laughs> That's the first thing I can say. There's a reason that all of these huge budget movies, uh, you know, pick your ma your Marvel movie, your Avengers movie. There's a reason they don't just film people out in the streets and go, oh, then we'll just fly in the background afterwards. They build these massive green screen sets because trying to crop around people who are moving and eliminate backgrounds is not a simple solution. It uses up a ton of resources. It is not a push button solution and you'd need to do it in most of these video editing softwares. You're, you, if, if it's not frame by frame, it's instance by instance. You don't just go, let me trace them, click a button and it's just going to follow them no matter what. There's so much detail that you need to put into that, that it's not that as much as people think that that's what I'd like to do. I just want to pull the background. Jay, talk to me a little bit about this. Have you ever had to sit and try to to intelligently mask now i know da vinci can do it now have you ever tried to intelligently mask around a five minute piece of footage um <clears throat> yeah so <laughs> so the process you're talking about is called rotoscoping where you trace around and you you create a mask around something and then you have to track it either automatically or manually but mostly both actually uh and the very uh one of the very first Da Vinci Resolve tutorials I ever made was how to clone yourself. And I had a little skit in, in the beginning of the video where I'm talking to myself, which I do whether or not I have a clone, but we, uh, it, it took forever. And that wasn't even a, a really detailed mask, but you have to, you know, you have to trace out point by point around somebody making sure that it's really accurate and then you have to track it now davinci resolve has a feature where it will automatically track it but it's not perfect it will lose it it will lose your subject throughout the tracking and then you have to go back and manually adjust it frame by frame to make sure everything works it takes forever it takes a lot of resources and the longer the clip like daniel said the uh the 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 resources are, it, it just, it starts to lag after a while because it does take an incredible amount of power. Now, DaVinci Resolve 17 did just release something called Magic Mask, where instead of like doing the full rotoscoping, you just draw a couple lines and it will intelligently figure out the mask and it works pretty well. Um, the motion tracking is still a little wonky, but I think in a few versions it might get there. But yeah, it's, it's still, even then, even then you got to go frame by frame after the auto tracking and adjust everything as it goes it, it's it's not easy it is it is not easy well that's one of the things i think people say to me like i'm not going to use Fillmore. i'm going to go pick da vinci because i know it can do these things and be, i've seen people i've done um instances where i've used the masking feature in filmora to do things like walking through text and i just blocked out the, the mask and people said this would be so much easier in a different software and i'm like you think so? <laughs> it's the same process. It's just some of the tools are a little more advanced in, in giving you really minute details to really tweak it and get it perfect. But it doesn't mean that the work that doesn't, it's not easier. People think these bigger softwares are, or more featured softwares or more expensive softwares are like, it's going to be just like Filmora. I click a button, but not what does something that Filmora doesn't. And I promise you, you're going to, you will, you'll, this is why I say always test out of a software if you can, if they have a trial version first, so you can see for yourself, feel the experience of it and decide, wow, maybe I didn't need this feature so much. Cause that's the other thing I ask when people ask me questions like, can I rotoscope around me? Can I do an intelligent masking? I really need that. I always wonder to myself, what, what kind of, what kind of things are you making for footage? Because sometimes I think people are making videos for YouTube and they just have one video they want to make that they want to mask themselves out. But their daily workflow and process, the type of videos they make, isn't every single day I rotoscope myself out. Every single day I remove the background. 
God bless you for this because that's <laughs> I wouldn't want that workflow in a million years. That is that would take me forever to get videos done because it's so like Jay said, even in the best softwares, it's hard and slow and painstaking. But you know, don't don't jump from a software because there was one little thing you wanted to do one day and your software didn't do it. Think about what you're going to be doing day after day, what you're going to be doing week after week, the kind of content you're going to be making, the kind of look to that content, look to some of the people that are your influences and say like, how, what kind of content do they, I want to make content like this person um, and what are they really doing more often than not so I can make a better decision? Because that's really what we're talking about here, Jay's workflow, like workflow. Give me, give me some input on what, why workflow is important. Uh, well, <clears throat> there <laughs> that's a loaded question i mean work workflow is super <laughs> it's super important you know everybody everybody works differently you know and and that's why there are so many different products out there that can do the same stuff like even though we're not talking about it today looking at premiere pro and davinci resolve they can do a lot of the same stuff it's just a matter of workflow but uh, and that's one of the things that you have to look at when you're choosing a software, you know, what, again, like I said before, like you've said before, Daniel, what is it that you want to do? You know, going back to that rotoscoping. Okay. If that's just a one-time thing and that's the only complicated thing you really want to do, there's a program out there called runway ML that lives on the cloud. It's 12 bucks a month. You can mask yourself out, create a green screen, bring that into Filmora. And there you go. <laughs> right you know? imagine but, that wait wait there's more than one way to skin a cat is that what you're trying right. to tell me yeah i mean if if there's if there are features that you want but you know you're not going to use them all the time there are dedicated products for that stuff you know so you can have the software that you know you're going to be using all the time and then go and take a look at these other dedicated products for the other stuff and use that for the video where you want to do something a little more complicated. That's a huge um, tip. I get that a lot where people will go, Daniel, how can I do like the hand written, the whiteboard animation in Filmora? Will you see like the hand come up and start drawing things and writing things? Mm -hmm. Neither DaVinci nor Filmora nor Adobe Premiere Pro is designed to this be a whiteboard animation software. While you could probably pull it off with a lot of effort, there are simple softwares that have all the presets for doing like whiteboard animation. The hand comes up and writes what you want that you can get that will do that easily. The same, I get the same question about cartoon animation. How can I do cartoon animation in Filmora? I did one animation segment to show people what it's like to actually animate. Like, and, and to this day, I'm like, boy, I have nothing but respect for animators who used to sit and draw frame by frame by frame because it's painstaking. But there are softwares like Toon Boom Harmony that like the guys that, uh, you know, Family Guy, who make Family Guy, use to do their cartoon animation because uh, it's designed to do that kind of 2D animation, 3D animation type stuff that if you want to get a little deeper, more like Toy Story kind of looking things, you know, this, this open source software like Blender out there that do that really well. But it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work and it is the farthest thing from just putting in videos of yourself, clicking buttons and making things happen. I promise you. Yeah, hundred percent. But I mean, really, when it comes to workflow, you got to look at like, what are the features that I really need all of the time? Like that's all, that's all you need to look at because there are those dedicated things that can do other stuff. So for me, I kind of do all of it all of the time, you know? So I, I, I need the tools that do the full blown color grading. I need the full, you know, DAW uh, digital audio workstation for those who don't know. Like I need that audio editing. I, I need, I don't do effects as much, but I still use them. Uh, and, and I need to be able to cut my footage and do transitions. Like I need all of that stuff all the time, which is why I went with DaVinci Resolve because it gives me all of that. Um, and it gives me all of it at the level that I need, which is super, super important. Cause I know, Divi uh, I know Filmora does have some color stuff mm -hmm. and it has some audio stuff. Um, very limited. The audio stuff in, in Filmora is really designed basic EQs, a little pitch mm -hmm. shifting, a little key framing to kind of control. But, um, you know, especially color. I think the basic color correction is very good in Filmora 10, but 
Da Vinci Resolve, again, was designed as a color correction, color coding um, tool to begin with before it had all these advanced features built out around it. So when it comes to dealing with color and color correction, the I, Adobe, none of them hold a candle as far as I'm concerned to Da Vinci. That is what Da Vinci does really well, among other things, but that is killer. One of the questions we got... Um, uh, in uh, from the from the chat was thank you Clint was uh, Jay Seesaw asked um, for Resolve do I get Studio Beta or Plain Beta uh, can you just uh, quickly describe the difference between the two yeah so it's the same as uh, the full release Studio or or Plain uh, the Plain one is free and you're going to get a lot of the the basic tools that you need you're still going to be able to edit your audio you're going to be able to build out effects in Fusion but you're going to be missing out on some resolution choices, some rendering choices, and most importantly, the GPU acceleration. But again, it's free with no watermark. So, uh, and you can still export up to 4K or I think UHD, um, which is just this 16 by nine version of 4K. And uh, so it really is good enough. If, if you're only making videos for YouTube, you don't want to do super complicated stuff. You don't mind waiting a little bit longer for render times. Free is 100% it's it's still amazing. I mean, I edited an entire episode of a TV show in the free version. Um, the studio version, uh, whether it's beta or full release, is going to cost you three hundred dollars, and um, and and but then you're going to get the GPU acceleration. You're going to be able to render at higher resolutions, uh, have timelines at higher resolutions. You're going to unlock a bunch of effects. You're going to unlock uh, video noise reduction in the color page, which is just amazing uh it's the number one reason why i upgraded to studio from the free version uh so it's just uh, unlocking more features so if you just want to try it out if that's your goal right now download the regular version because it's free and then if you decide you like it you want to unlock those other features move on to studio now that's an interesting thing that you were talking about there kind of the <clears throat> features i think sometimes people think that um that all video editing softwares are more features but similar in build and I, and that's one of the things that i think always surprises some creators now let me see if i can pull up um i'll pull up uh phil mora over here give me one second um and i'll just show you for anyone who uh, is familiar with uh, phil mora you'll know um you'll know this look so you know this look of phil mora right phil mora is really simple Everything is designed to be in basically three blocks. Your upper left is where you're going to import things, and it's also where you're going to find the more detailed levels like your audio, your titles, your transitions. Basically, anytime you click on like a clip in your timeline, uh, that'll change the upper left where you're, uh, you're allowed to go into the deeper levels of all the video, the audio, the color, any kind of animation, keyframing, things like that. So that's your main control panel in the left. Down below is your timeline, and up to the upper right is your preview, win preview window. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can move some of these around and go, I want a bigger preview window. Uh, you can click on these and you can change the layout. So you can go, I, I want this layout, or maybe you use more timeline. But at the end of the day, um, this is all, this is all it. It's always going to feel pretty much like this three box setup. Um, with the exception of sometimes you'll find something, if you're trying to do like a crop and zoom, you'll get a pop-up window like this. It allows you to work inside of the main window, but that is really all of it in a very simple look, very compact, very easy to find things. Um, but DaVinci Resolve is a very different experience <laughs> than that. Jay, do you want to um do you want to do you want to pull up uh Da Vinci for us and you can show people first of all tell me this Jay while I have you here yeah Filmora really does everything in one window and there might be some pop up windows or changes one window how many sort of full page windows or pages layers does Da Vinci Resolve run seven wow. <laughs> Seven, uh, one page for each step of the editing process, uh, which is crazy. I can actually pull up DaVinci Resolve right now and let's go ahead. Oh, there we go. The it's the screen. infinite zoom. Okay. Uh. <laughs> All right. So here it is. Here's DaVinci Resolve. Let's start from page one. This is the media page and this is where uh, you can actually come and you bring in all of your footage. And these are all of the folders, the files and stuff that are on my computer. So if I just navigate to one of these here, let's go ahead to uh, videos. 
we'll just open up my B-roll folder here, which is going to take forever. There we go. And here's just a bunch of B-roll here. And I can drag whatever I want into my media pool. And these are going to be the, the files that go into my project. I can change and view metadata. I can organize it into bins. This is dedicated to bringing things into the project and organizing it. And then cut uh, is really great for... Uh, doing just kind of a rough cut. I don't have any media in here right now, but I, I can just go in, I can throw all my footage in here and I can go out and literally just cut out the parts of the footage that I want to keep, throw it into a timeline. And when that's all done, you can do uh, basic, basic uh, effects in here as well. But for that, for like refining the timeline, making things look exactly the way you want, this is the edit page and that's this is where your timeline would be all of your audio and video tracks and uh your inspectors where you can change uh the zoom and the crop and all that stuff we've got some effects down here and a lot of this stuff you can turn on and off so i can close out my effects library i can close out all of my clips would be right here in the media pool i can close that out that out if i want uh we've got an audio mixer um this so you can see your uh your audio levels here and you can view metadata again and you can close all of that stuff out and you can really the only other customization that you have here is you can make your playback monitors there are two this is your source monitor where you're looking at the footage before it goes into your timeline and then this is your timeline monitor where you're seeing your actual finished product so that's the edit page then we've got fusion which is all of your uh, all of your effects. This is where you would literally build effects from the ground up. It's a node based compositor, so it's not like layers like an After Effects. If anybody's familiar with that, it's actually pieces. Uh, it's just little itty bitty pieces of an effect that you build out uh, to create an effect. And then the creme de la creme. This is the color page. This is where you do all of your color grading. You've got your wheels. You can navigate. These are power windows, which are uh, kind of like those pre-built masks that Daniel was talking about in Filmora. Um, you can also do uh, curves and stuff like that. So you can create custom ones. That's where you would do like rotoscoping and stuff like that. You've got tracking. You've got, I don't even remember what this is. This is... Uh, Oh, I think this is still tracking and stuff. You got blur and sharpening. You've got, you just got a whole bunch of stuff. This is where you do color grading. You also have GPU accelerated effects in here. Um, and then you've got Fairlight, which is a full blown uh, digital audio workstation. So you can fully edit your audio in here. Uh, you've got some built-in stuff like EQ, compressors, dialogue processors, and then it also supports VST effects. So I have got a bunch of stuff that I have downloaded and tested out and used. And then finally, I, I gotta say, done, Jay, I, I'm so jealous right there because <laughs> you, the, I have been saying the one thing, you, you know, the other stuff I'm like, I'm looking at this going, look how much, look at this is a really, there's a learning curve here. But the ability to really control the audio and uh, use VST effects, which is if people don't know what those are, it's a technology designed by um, by Steinberg company where they actually are like little like digital versions of of um, inserts. If you could, the best way I can explain them: if you ever been in, ever um, been in a guitar store, or ever been into a recording studio, if someone has like a guitar pedal that will add reverb, or you're in a recording studio and they have a big piece of processing gear that's an EQ or a reverb or a compressor, you can just drop those in and use them. They they can use VST plugins that are designed from completely different companies that do nothing but build great VST plugins, and then you can drop them into your audio chain and actually start using really high quality audio effects that I, I wish we had. All right, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just got really <laughs> jealous there, Bell. <laughs> that's all right. Um, and then uh, last but not least, once that's all done, so I mean, you can see up till now, we've gone through the entire process. We've brought stuff in in the media. We've done our rough cut in the cut page. We've refined our timeline in the edit page. We've put our effects on our clips in the fusion page. We've done our color grading. We've done our audio. Now that all that's left is deliver where you can uh, you can render out your videos and export your videos in a whole bunch of different formats so you can completely customize all of your render settings they've also got presets for uh, let's see YouTube 720 1080 and uh, 4k you can export uh, with presets for Vimeo for Twitter for 
all sorts of stuff. You can even export timelines if you want to say bring out your timeline and bring it into Final Cut or Premiere or even Avid. You can export timelines for those softwares so you can bring them in, which is really good. This is kind of a leftover thing from when DaVinci Resolve was just a color grading tool because people would start their edit in Final Cut and then they would bring it over into Resolve and then they'd have to bring it back into Final Cut or Premiere or Avid or whatever to finish up their video. And that's what these are for. So you've got you've got basically all, uh, all you need. And just to show you what Studio can give you, I can render up to, this looks like, oh, it looks like only up to, you can do the full aperture 4K right here. Um, yeah, so that is DaVinci Resolve in a nutshell. Uh, that, that's a very big nutshell. <laughs> that is definitely like a walnut it's not like a, it's not like a little seed um yeah i think this is one of those things you have to think about I, again i think sometimes people go well i'm used to using a, this <laughs> and everything is right here and then i say and i say well you know what i'm going to start using davinci resolve and what happens is they're overwhelmed thinking but it was so easy in Filmora. Everybody wants the best of all worlds. I want it simple. I want to click a button and I want the editor to do all the work for me. And the reality is that don't confuse the Filmora experience that really was built to do that. Simple, effective editing that, that has really fast workflow with higher end, more featured, feature rich um, video editors like DaVinci Resolve that you can do more, but you're going to be working. I can do things in Filmora much faster than uh, someone who was proficient at Resolve could because some of this stuff is push button. I just go click, click, mm -hmm. it's done. And it doesn't mean that like a, someone like Jay isn't a, a great editor. He just has to go through more steps to get there. And I think people don't always realize that that's the case. So super important to think about when you're thinking about the kind of videos you're gonna be making. Now, one thing you said to me, Jay, which I thought was really genius, um, in thinking about which one you would choose, you said something like, you know, think about where you're going to be a few years down the line. And, and it was, a, you and I had a difference of opinion on that. I want you to tell mm -hmm. me your thoughts on that and what, and what you meant by that. Yeah. So my, my whole theory, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my, my whole theory is if you know what your end goal is, right? If you are starting out video editing and you know that you want to be a professional editor, uh, I, my theory is why I waste time. You know, I, I would choose if you know that you're looking at Filmora and you're looking at Resolve, since those are what we're looking at today. And you know, you want to be a professional editor down the line, start and Resolve and learn Resolve. If you know that you are starting out video editing, you know, you're never going to do anything too, too complicated. Uh, and you don't want all of that control and you don't want to have to build everything from the ground up, then go with Filmora. Why jump into something that's more complicated if you're not gonna do stuff that's more complicated? Um, but why? But but again, why waste time learning something super simple if you're gonna have to relearn something later if you know that you wanna do more complicated stuff down the road? Yeah, and that I think is, that's, that a, that's, a, that's a great position to be in. I've It was funny because Jay and I have a different take on this, um, but we agree on one thing that the fundamentals. I think that most video um, editing software, uh, it can like it, it all does the same basic stuff at its core, which is learning. You, you know, you're you're bringing in video. You're learning how to process it, how to slice it, how to arrange it, how to put title overlays or text overlays, how to get the color to change and get a little bit better, how to put the audio underneath it, and how to you know bring in some music beds and things like that. Um, I've always said this, you know, if you want to learn how to, um, if you want to learn how to ride a motorcycle in your two, maybe learn to balance on, you know, like a bicycle first, or, you know, maybe start with a tricycle. Don't go right mm -hmm. for the Harley, because I think a lot of the things you learn as you're getting better are transferable. I think if I open up DaVinci Resolve right now and start learning it, there's so many things I know about video editing that are fundamentals that it's going to be easier for me to learn that software than someone who's never done video editing in their entire life, open up seven pages and go, I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm out. I guess this isn't a job for me because it's too hard. So I have a, a, not that Jay is wrong. I just have a different take on it, which is if you're someone who's easily overwhelmed by something that opens up and looks like an encyclopedia, 
maybe start with something like a Filmora and learn the basic chops because it doesn't matter. This is the one thing Jay and I do agree on. You know, if you ever go look at really great movies and really great uh, videos on, even on people, you know, people like Casey Neistat who have destroyed on YouTube, they're not using all fancy swirl transitions and crazy stuff. They put all of their effort into production, getting the right camera, the right lens, getting the lighting right, setting and blocking your shot, building a script, creating a storyline before you ever go into the editor. It's This is, I think sometimes people think, if I have a great video editing software, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be killing it, I'm gonna be crushing it. And nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. Jay, what is your take on that, pal? I 100% agree. You know, the great videos aren't great because somebody did great rotoscoping. You know, they're, they're great because they told a great story. Um, and, and I think that is, that is the most important thing is learning those basics, you know, because honestly you can throw some footage in there, make sure the audio is good. Audio is important no matter what. I don't care what anybody says, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but as far as putting a video together, you know, you have to learn how to cut footage, you know, and not just how to use the cut tool, but like learn where to make a cut. Uh, because that, that honestly is more important than learning how to color grade. It's, it's more important than learning the superhero landing effect. It's, it's more important than any of that learning when and where to make a cut and what type of cut to use will 110% make your videos better no matter what software you're you're looking at those basics those fundamentals you have to get them down and you know you and i talked about this those fundamentals can be learned no matter what software you're using yeah i mean it's 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 the core of all video editing software is really bringing stuff in bringing it down into some sort of a timeline-ish area where you work on it and having some sort of preview screen somewhere that's gonna let you see what you're doing with it as you start mixing and dicing and slicing it up. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's just, there's just listen, I, and, I, and I understand why people see something on YouTube and go, oh, I wanna make that effect, or they see a movie and go, oh, I wanna make that effect. But think about, like Jay said earlier, your goals. Like if you're gonna be a wedding videographer, like I'm gonna, I wanna make money filming weddings and I wanna be able to make the wedding footage and be, and be paid for that. You're not, you're not gonna be like trying to get the bride to fly in from the sky into a Superman landing and then the ground busts over. Like, you know, this is the right. stuff, you're gonna be like, listen, I want it to look good. I want a good colored shot. I want you to get the right angles. I wanna make sure it's lit well. I wanna make sure that the audio sounds good. I wanna make sure that the music bed underneath it really makes sense with what you're showing. You know, that's the kind of stuff that has a lot less to do with fancy video editors and has a lot more to do with creators learning the skill of becoming a great video editor that's really important yeah and you know you've brought up a couple times the lighting and the and the filming and all that stuff and yeah it all works together you know you it, i kind of look at it like making a puzzle from the ground up you know you're behind the camera if you're behind the camera the guy doing the lighting or maybe you're the guy who does all of it all of that camera work all the filming you're making the pieces and then editing you're putting those pieces together well if you go out and you make a whole bunch of crappy pieces that don't fit together and don't match it doesn't matter how much editing you do you're gonna you're gonna have a horrible looking puzzle it's yeah. gonna look like a, a picasso gone wrong you know it's <laughs> so you know it, it all it all works together but you have to learn those basics first you know yeah walk, and, and, walk and let's be run. clear let's jay just quickly if uh, now um uh da vinci is the more expensive of the two but not by a crazy mm -hmm. it's three two hundred ninety nine dollars it's not a it's that can be very expensive for some people but it's not an astrical astronomical amount of money Knowing that you've spent $300, um, you know, let's say you did, you may have gotten it in different ways, on the software, in comparison, the tools, the cameras, the lighting, the set you're sitting in right now, the gear, the ATM mini, the ability to do the thing that you want to do that has nothing to do with the actual video editing, not the software itself, the actual making sure that you're building something that's editable, would you say you've spent more or less than $300 on all those other components that go along with it? <laughs> Take your time. Uh, so, so the so the, the camera is twelve hundred. Um, <laughs> the, the the lighting, 
Uh, lighting. This light was 150. Well, this light was free because it was a gift from Tech Examined, who I saw in the chat. What's up, Michael? <laughs> um, so the the other lighting, the practical lighting alone, we're looking at over three hundred dollars. That's not uh, even the stuff to light me and film no. me. Just the practical lighting was three hundred dollars. So yeah, it's it's. I've invested way more uh, in in lighting and and audio too. I've yeah. wait, I've you know not even to to mention audio. I've I've, uh, I've invested more in that stuff. The the video editing software out of everything is it's yeah video editing is what i have spent the least amount of money on yeah and i think that's where the investment is i mean I, listen i make no joke about the fact that i am surrounded by too much gear i mean rock and roll space station uh, <laughs> you know that what we call it the rock and roll space <laughs> yeah. station it's just i mean i'm i've got two monitors a laptop i've got two systems down below i've got three monitors over there i've got more gear in front of me that i know what to do with it's just a never ending a uh, puzzle of trying to make sure that the thing I bring into my video edit is is looks and sounds the best, and in, in my live streams included, that really looks and sounds the best that I can get them at that point in time. So again, trying to lean just on the video editor is uh, is 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 like. <clears throat> It's like leaning on the um, the fuel you buy for your race car <laughs> to get you to win the races. It really is. There's so many other pieces that go in along the way that you can sh you should consider. Uh, listen, Jay, we do have a questionnaire that I put up here. Well, I want to take a look at some of the questions people have been asking. Let me um, let me uh, sure. let me switch over to this and switch to this input here. Um, I got a question from D H R U V who said, "From which web website can we find stock uh, footage images?" Uh, I love your videos. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. What I can tell you is, I tend to use um, for free pixabay.com is a great one. Um, uh, if I'm going to do paid stuff, Storyblocks is the next thing up. They have uh, audio. Uh, video clips, images, sound effects. Um, and then if I want higher end just images, I use, I also have a subscription to uh, stockadobe.com, which has great images. I tend to use those um, mostly images in B-roll and in thumbnails. Uh, and then the, behind that is probably uh, productioncrate.com is my fourth that I also uh, buy certain things like VFX and different things like that that I might layer into a certain video. Um, they have they have more they have they're more effect driven. So if it's like I need a graph glass breaking kind of look to a screen or something that, that's really an effect driven thing, I'll go to Production Craig. Jay, who do you use for resources when you're trying to get that extra B roll or images or things like that? So free stuff. Uh, my my first love was Pexels.com. Uh, that was, uh, and also Pixabay, but you already mentioned that. So Pexels.com is a bunch of free stock footage and stock photos. Uh, Unsplash is also really good for stock photos. Uh, another free one uh, that is really cool that I, I just became aware of is called Mix Kit and Reshot. They're brought to you by, uh, they're uh, they're made by Envato. It's a, it's a site that's made by Envato and that's got free stock footage uh photos, music, sound effect, like all the, all of the things. Uh, but as far as paid options, uh, my number one go to, I do have a story box account, but my number one go to is art grid because with, uh, art grid, if you're on the plan that I'm on, you can actually get a hold of the log and raw files, which is great for doing color grading tutorials, which I tend to do a lot of. So, uh, art grid art list, uh, is where I get most of my, uh, music and stock footage. Fantastic. That's awesome. That good tip, God, good tip right there, my friend. Let me see. What else do we have over here? Um, next question we have was from FNLP. Which software would be better for film restoration product projects or remastering projects, i.e. color matching, color management, values for the foot? This is a, to me, this is a no brainer. If you're going to compare uh, Filmora to Da Vinci, I'm going to tell you that right off the bat, and Jay will agree, Da Vinci started as a color grading um, piece of software. They just hands down, I think they still to this day are probably the best um, color grading software out there. Jay, what do you think? Yeah, hundred percent. There's actually a lot of people who do film restoration in um, in DaVinci Resolve. There's actually a tool called Capture uh, where you can actually plug in like the whatever the film tools are. I've never once worked with film in video, but there are tools that you can connect to your computer. It will play the film. You can capture it into DaVinci Resolve. Uh, they've got tools like Super Scale. So if you have really old film that was shot in lower resolution, you can actually upscale it uh, to you know, 4k, uh, yeah, it's a lot of people use it for film restoration. So I would definitely say DaVinci resolve on that one. 
All right. And the next question we have came from, I don't have a channel. <laughs> okay, Nage. Um, I upgraded Filmora 9 to uh, Filmora 10. Uh, my, my computer became blurry, so I'm trying to get back to Filmora 9, but I don't know how. I'm not sure why. Again, that could be a system spec uh, thing that you want to take a peek at. Make sure that your system is as at least meets, but preferably uh, exceeds the minimum system requirements. Uh, if you want to go back, there is a website called File Hippo, Hippo like the animal, File Hippo, uh, and they hold uh, previous versions of all sorts of software, and I know they have a Filmora page that you can download previous versions that were released and reinstall them, because Filmora doesn't always capture them. You can reach out to Filmora and probably get an older version, but FileHippo.com has the previous versions. I think all the way back to at seven, I think I'd seen in there, and you can download an older version, and it's the same thing. It's a, it's not, it's a, it's virus safe, and and they actually are same license applies, and uh, they're pretty decent. I've done it a few times when I, when they did an update, and I went, oh, there's a, there's a bug in the new update. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta go back to the last one. I'll just go to File Hippo and grab the last version. Uh, let me see what else we got over here. Uh, next question. Let me scroll to number. We got a few in here. Let me see what I can get through. Um, none. Uh, have you, have you tried premiere pro? Uh, and if you have how difficult or how easy I have played with premiere pro, I played with a lot of softwares, um, over time. And what I'll tell you is premiere pro is no joke. It's, it's, a uh, it uses a different system than what Jay was talking about with the nodes, but it is, you know, it's a fairly advanced and they have two different like well-known versions, which is Premiere Pro. And then for more effects driven kind of tricks and things is the after, Adobe After Effects, which is more um, effect, I don't want to say laden, but it's it's sort of built around the idea of getting in there and doing more than the, you know, be the higher end stuff. If you're really into doing like, like a science fiction kind of thing, a horror kind of thing, I'd probably lean towards After Effects to bring in some of that stuff. But they're no joke. One thing is they also, they, work on a subscription base. So it's, if you're buying it, it's $249 base price a year that you pay every year, as long as you use the software. So price point tricky, it's going to be the more expensive option than the other two we're talking about here. Jay, any takes on, uh, on Adobe Premiere Pro? Yeah. So I've now officially used all of the software that we have talked about today. I started off on Filmora, moved to Premiere Pro and then went to DaVinci. Um, Premiere Pro is, it's great. It's got amazing tools. I still watch a lot of Premiere Pro tutorials just so I can get ideas for tutorials I can do in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, it's it's my, little, my little hack for coming up with video ideas, but Premiere Pro is great. Um, the one thing that you want to be aware of is not, not only um, with the Creative Cloud, so we're now not only looking at Premiere Pro, you're also looking at Adobe Audition, which is their audio software. You're looking at After Effects, which, you know, like you said, is their effects driven software. Um, it's not all in one thing. So with Premiere Pro, it's even, I would say, more important to make sure that you have a, a computer that has way more than the minimum system requirements and also uh, make sure that computer is optimized for that stuff. Cause it's not just the components, it's how the components play together. Like that, that makes a difference too. Um, because there will be times when I was using Premiere Pro, well, I'll, I'd be putting together a timeline and be like, all right, now it's time to do the audio work. And I, you know, use what's called a dynamic link to send everything over to audition. Uh, and, and now I've got two Adobe products open at the same time. And my old, you know, my super old computer with four gigabytes of RAM was not happy about that decision. So there's that, but it, it is, it is great. It's got all the tools, especially if you have the creative cloud subscription and you get all of those apps. Yeah. And it is, but it is probably the highest tier in terms of price point for the con sort of consumer slash pro editing software that you're going to see. Uh, and it does, it's, it's resource intensive. Uh, so be very aware of that. Uh, let me see right here. We've had a question that was, what's the big difference between Filmora 10 and DaVinci Resolve? We've just covered a whole bunch of differences. I don't think there's one, but like we said, there's, um, features, price, resource requirements, um, um, learning curve, 
Um, I think, you know, uh, this, yeah, that's where I'd put the big four probably. So, you know, hopefully I'll uh, check the stream out again. Hopefully that, um, if you look at the replay, we've covered a lot of this. You can actually look back and see what some of these things look like and get some of these answers and help you make a decision if you're leaning one way or another based on what you have, um, for your workflow and what's coming up for, um, on your plate in the future. Let me see what else we have over here. Um, what's your take on familiar charging for future updates now when in the past they didn't someone else said this to me I've never heard anything about this. This is news to me. I've never heard Filmora charging for updates I, All I can tell you right now is I've gotten every update on my original license and everyone I know has gotten all the updates on their original license So if that's changed that's news to me until someone can show me that then um then, then I don't, I don't know anything about it. I do know that Movavi will cover you up to like, that was when I used to Movavi covers you up to whatever, whatever version they're in. So you get all the updates within that version, but if they release a completely new one, that's like a new level, then the license, you have to buy a different license for that. But Filmora, basic Filmora is fine. And I'll, I'll see if I can find out more. Cause you know, not the first person who said that I, I updated today, this morning, I went and downloaded the latest update. Uh, to make sure I had the re most recent version. Uh, that's one thing I should point out. Anyone out there, <clears throat> um, one of the things about using Filmora, let me just pull this up so I can share it here, is that um, Filmora, if you go up into the Help tab in the upper right, uh, and if you scroll down, you'll see About. If you click on that, it'll tell you what version you have installed. Currently, I have version 10.1.20.16. Now, different people will have different versions depending on when they downloaded it, what region they live in, what part of the world they live in, because different and what which server they downloaded it from. Um, and one thing you want to be aware of is inside of Filmora, you can say Check for Update, and a lot of times it'll tell you, Hey, you have the latest version. But also a lot of times that that's not actually true. This morning it told me I had the most recent version and they just haven't announced the new glitch update. So what I do is I go to the website. I actually go to where it says, you know, download, try the free version and that's their download. And I download it and it gives me the most recent version available that they're offering on the website in my region. So I usually do that at least, you know, once every couple of weeks because Phil Moore puts out glitch fixes and bug fixes almost weekly i mean really it's like a once every couple of weeks you'll see a new version out there where they there was an issue and they're very proactive about if there's something not working right they'll tweak it if there's some new little thing they want to add in they'll tweak it so they they update quite a bit jay how often does resolve tend to put out bug fixes new versions that you need to be aware of um i would say not weekly Definitely not weekly. <laughs> that's that's impressive. That might be a little exaggeration, um, but literally, I think there's been since Filmora 10 has come out. I think they're on their like 10th or 11th update. It's only been out for you know whatever five months or something. Yeah, I so what I can tell you, the beta releases come out fairly quickly. Um, I mean, we're talking. I think the, the version eight of the beta came out two two weeks ago, and now we're on the ninth version. Um, so it, it comes out, those beta versions come out quickly. The, the, once you get the full release, they come out more slowly because by the time they get to the full release, they fixed most of those bugs, um, every once in a while, but you know, so you may get like one every month or so, uh, unless something really, 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 really goes wrong. <laughs> well, they're still <laughs> but, saying that they're in beta, right? So you're probably referring to 17. They know they're in beta. <laughs> Um, so I, I would expect that right now you're probably seeing more, a little more frequently because they're trying to fix those things that people are responding and saying, Hey, that was an issue or that crashed or that caused something while they're, while they're trying to get it out of beta. Yeah. And, and one other thing to be aware of, if you're one of the people who wants to stay in the, the prior full release until the next full release is out. So you don't want to deal with the beta versions. I am. 99.9% .9 sure that there will be that once the beta release starts, once the next beta starts, there are no more updates to the current full release. So once the 17 beta came out, I don't think 16, I don't think version 16 has seen any more updates. I think all of the efforts go into the, the next beta. That makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense why it would be that way. Okay, see what else we got here. Um, Seesaw says, I've been thinking about DaVinci or HitFilm. I already have Filmora, but I do VFX. What would be better, DaVinci or HitFilm? That's an interesting question, and yet it depends on what you mean by VFX. If Because VFX can be like a, it's such a broad term. Um, but if you're doing kind of visual or virtual effects, um, <clears throat> 
I, I would probably say hit film is good. It's hit the pro version of hit film is pretty good. I mean, it's pretty good. And they have a free version. That's not bad. I still think da, Vin da Vinci probably is a better overall video editor, but I think if you're trying to do VFX, I don't know that I would really lean towards either one. Jay, what's your take? I don't know that specifically I would say Da Vinci is like a better VFX editor than I would probably be pushing it towards After Effects before I'd be pushing it towards Da Vinci or Hit Film. Um, I think, I don't know. I've had very limited exposure to Hit Film. Uh, I know Hit Film and Vegas just kind of merged and they, they, they there's Vegas of. Uh, Vegas effects, which is a brand new product, um, that I am actually testing out this week. Uh, but they, I have very limited experience, so I, I don't know. I can tell you that largely when it comes to effects, especially in platforms where you're building things from the ground up. So things like after effects, things like fusion in DaVinci Resolve fusion also comes as a standalone thing, but also things like blender and all of that stuff, it is largely a matter of workflow preference uh, and, and basically what works better with your brain. So I can't speak much to hit film for VFX, but I can tell you between Fusion and After Effects, I was in Premiere for a while and After Effects still makes almost zero sense to me. <laughs> it's tricky. You know? Yeah. F I've looked fusion, at it. Fusion, I looked at it once and I went, oh. to me. yeah, well, right, one thing, yeah. here's a good, you know what I would recommend the, uh, the good answer to this, uh, the, the YouTube channel film riot, who does a lot of kind of, if not VFX, but effects driven stuff did do an in-depth review of hit film. Uh, so, and it wasn't that long ago, maybe six or eight months ago, go over to film riot and then check out the, their, their video on hit film. And they were very impressed with it as an editor overall. And they do lean on effects driven stuff, not much such via, but effects driven content where they show you how to recreate some of the stuff you've seen in movies. Uh, I just would say heavy metal chef is now a member, uh, in the uh, battalion world. Thank you for joining the memberships. Make sure you head over to the memberships tab of my YouTube channel and scroll down. You will see a tier of options that are now available to you click on definitely all that stuff in there is going to be fantastic but make sure you click on the facebook option and put a request in to join our members only facebook group so i can let you in that's where all the real magic starts happening in there and so uh welcome aboard it's great to have you uh let me look over here and see what else we got so, so some questions um see if we can stay on track here it's tricky sometimes it's tricky to stay on track on target um uh let's see let me see uh right here this is uh more for daniel why wouldn't film more update to x on my on to 10 on my computer is there certain steps i need to do to update no it's as simple as that go to the website like i told you down and click on the free you know where it shows the free trial on filmora.wondershare.com if you go in there and download um and just download the latest version it, it should give you um 10 which is the latest version uh which i definitely think that you should check out it's i think it's got more features than nine <clears throat> there was an issue years ago like when you had Filmora. if you didn't if you're if you were trying to download the latest version of filmora on a 64-bit OS. The original like Filmora 7 ran on like a 32-bit OS. So people were trying to update to a recent version. It kept feeding them the older one only because the newer version didn't run on their operating system. So make sure you have your system. Again, when we go back, make sure your system absolutely at least meets or exceeds the minimum system requirements so that you can get the kind of experience and make sure all features are doing what they should. Um, but don't, if you might be asking me, you might be thinking, I clicked on update from inside Filmora 9. Too many changes to fill more at 10. When we came from eight to nine, you had to go download it directly from the website. That's always what I recommend. Go to filmora.wondershare.com, download the latest version right from the homepage. That will give you what you're looking for. Uh, let me see over here. What's this question? Uh, hey, Daniel, I really admire and respect your opinion. If I was to buy a computer for editing and streaming, what system would you recommend on a smart on a starter budget? Should I build my own or should I get an inexpensive gamers PC? That's a really good question, my friend. That's like a really good question. Um, 
I'm going to give you my quick input. And I'm going to let Jay run with this. I like building my own systems. I'm a huge fan of building computers. I think it's a lot easier than people think it is. And it can save you a lot of money because you can buy the pieces you want, put them together. And they're really kind of like clicking Legos to be all said and done. There's some BIOS things you have to learn and tweaking them a bit and make, if you're going to try to overclock them. But one thing I would always make clear to you is gaming PCs aren't always the best option for editing. People just think it's a gaming PC. It's, a, it's really fast. Gaming PCs are designed to do... My friend Danielle compares it like this. She says it's like a race car. It does one thing really fast, really fast back and forth. That's the way they're designed. Where video editing computers, you really want to build something that has like graphics cards that are going to have, um, it's going to have, you know, more, more ability to have many things happening at once, not necessarily super fast, but the ability to do multiple tasks without interfering with the other. That's why you start hearing things about NVIDIA making, you know, graphics cards that have all new CUDA cores and you're talking, you know, you know, that, that, you know, how many cores it has, it, that, things like that, that get more in depth. So what I would do is I'd start learning about what's the right um the right kind of um pc for you um and what you're going to be what kind of software you're going to run on it uh and then look at your budget in the chat right now um is our is a good friend of mine iggy from this bites for you absolutely check out his his own his channel because he actually used to work for alienware um and he is a he's like a, his whole channel talks about building pcs he uses filmora so uh and so he's a guy who could teach you all about building the kind of computers and how to do it the right way and put them together uh a very very bright guy so that is the resource for you mr iggy from this bites for you what's your take on that jay in terms of one thing i want to add stay away from laptops if you're going to be a serious editor i know people go it's an, a laptop i want it small so i can carry it around but real editing is so hard on a laptop only because, and, and this is my take, it's if you need to move it around a lot, that's cool. But if you're gonna, if you can build a station, you're gonna get more features cheaper in a PC because they're they the what they what it costs to cram those features down into a smaller um, laptop as opposed to buying them for a, a your built a built PC is gonna be more cost effective. Uh, and the other thing is is that um, you, it's easy to upgrade a PC if you get a good decent motherboard and you get the ability to you know add things onto it. Uh, laptops are more difficult to upgrade things like graphics cards in, um, and you're gonna start hitting a ceiling quickly. So think about again like we talked earlier workflow and things jay what's your take uh basically the same as yours uh, i am i am all about the custom pc now i didn't build mine um be for a number of reasons uh one one of those reasons is i tend to break things so uh i did <laughs> figured let the professionals handle it so i got mine built by by puget systems um and they uh yeah but i i, I think you're right I, because when you Build something yourself when you build it yourself, especially if you do the research beforehand. One, you're going to be cutting costs. Two, you can make sure that, like I said before, not only do you have good components, but you are making sure that those components work together for the software that you're using. Um, and yeah, this bites for you. Iggy is a great channel. Also, uh, uh, Matt, uh, what's his name? Matt, who is Matt Johnson? Uh, he's got, uh, he's a, like a wedding videographer, but he's got a, a, a series of playlists on there about budget PC builds. Uh, so he builds like 4k editing machines for like a thousand bucks or even less than that, I think. So, um, but yeah, I'm 100% about custom PCs and, uh, yeah, same thing with laptops. I, I would stay away from them unless you know, you're going to be moving around the thing. There are some really good laptops coming out now. Um, but like, I think the, the only one that I would recommend on the PC side costs like 2,500 bucks or something like that. And you can build a custom PC for less than that. Uh, but they're, they're only good if you're going to be moving around a lot and you want, you know, a way to dump your footage, maybe throw a rough cut together before you get home. Like they're good for portability, but if you're not going to be a portable editor, don't get a portable machine. I gave yeah. my laptop to my girlfriend once I got the <laughs> so. Well, you know, it's funny because I do, <laughs> uh, you know, I do, I do a lot of stuff on this. This is my travel PC. I leave it here to bring up things that integrates with my system. But most of the time I'm not editing here. And that has like an i7 in it. And I think it's running like an NVIDIA, uh, I don't know, like a 20. 
50 or something in there and it's all right it'll get the job done but if anything i just mostly use it for on the go so i can start a project and then i get it into like a, a you know an external you know ssd and then i'll bring it home and i'll do the real i just do some assembling on the go when i'm out traveling filming some stuff if we're at an event or convention together jay i might capture some stuff and bring it in and start roughing out a project but i'll never finish in a laptop not that you can't and the new macbooks that are uh, new the m1 series uh, now, a lot of those need wrappers. Things like Filmora aren't natively going to run properly on an M1 without a wrapper to allow it to function because um, that's a brand new chip because uh, Intel used to make all of their chips. And and Mac, you know, Apple looked at Intel and said, we'd like you to design a chip just for us. And they went, ah, I don't think so. And they went, okay. And they just stopped using Intel for their new machines and invented their own M1 chip, which is a really great, fast chip and affordable. It, um, it changed the price point of all of those new MacBooks and um, an Apple, they have like an Apple um, iMac mini, that's like 700 bucks now. And there's there's some real good price points. I used to always say Apple was just really expensive, but the new M1 thing kind of changed that game a little bit. I would consider some of that new M1 stuff, but also make sure that your software can run on it because it is a different type of thing uh, right now. Hold on, I want to go back one. There was a question in here specifically for you, Jay, that I want to make sure I don't miss. Um, okay. While you're while you're looking for that, I just want to piggyback off of the M1 thing real quick. Sure. Um, there is a version of DaVinci Resolve that is specifically built for the M1 chips. Um, so if you are looking at trying out DaVinci Resolve, uh, you'll see two different versions of 17. You'll see 17.0 and 17.1. 17.0 is for everything but an M1 chip. And then the 17.1 is for the M1 chip. So just be aware of that. And yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's do this. Um, this was specifically for you, Jay, from uh, Drone in Nature. Jay, is it possible to edit 360 videos on DaVinci Resolve 17 Studio? I just got the Insta 361 X2. That's a tough question. Ooh, that is a tough question because I've never once edited 360 video. I don't think it has a native app for 360. Um, I know the, I think the Insta one X comes with its own software. Oh yes. Patrick Sterling in the chat with the win. See, this is why, this is why I love my community because when I don't know something they do, there you go. <laughs> so yes, the answer is yes. Do I know how to do it? Absolutely not. But yes, you can. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's really funny because uh, I actually have a friend um, who has <clears throat> it's, his channel is called the man with the hat. And he figured out how to do edit 360 video in Filmora using a third party app just to make sure that it would um, it would actually code, you know, code it in the way that, that Filmora could understand it. Um, and he's got a video on his channel. If you just Googled how to edit 360 video in Filmora, you'll find his uh, his video that walks you through it. So it's you'd be surprised. A lot of times you do need um, you do need to think about some third party stuff with Filmora. That's one of the things I've talked about before. Yeah. It doesn't always come as simple and easy as, as we would like. Uh, and DaVinci is going to offer you some features that um, are going to be a little more native in there, but you're going to spend a little time and effort um, figuring them out. Listen, Jay, I can't thank you enough for coming here today and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Um, can you please remind people the name of your channel where they can find you? Sure. Uh, name of the channel is Jay Lipman. Uh, and, and that's where I am most days doing something or other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got the link to Jay's <laughs> channel down in the description of this uh, live stream. One of the questions that was asked, thank you, Clint, for staying on top of this, is could we add some of these other links later on to make sure the things we've talked about are available? Um, and I will. We'll go back through this, and I'll make sure I talk to Jay to get the links to anything that he's mentioned. And I will put them in the description of this video so you can find these things. Check them out for yourself. Um, Jay, once again, thank you so much. Everybody, please subscribe to Jay's channel if you have interest, not just in DaVinci Resolve, but learning how to be a better video editor. His channel is fantastic. There's a reason I'm friends with Jay because I steal all my best ideas from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. You've uh, you've 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 been a good friend and a huge help on my on my YouTube journey. So I really appreciate awesome. it. This was tons of fun.
And thank you everyone in the chat who's been here asking such great questions, people who filled out the questionnaire. Thanks to my pal Clint for being my assistant today and making sure that we got through this smoothly. Uh, we will see you guys all again back out there in YouTube world. If you have any questions that we didn't uh, get to answer, drop them in the comments section on the replay and I promise I will come back and I will address those and I will twist Jay's arm to do the same. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> all right, guys, you have a... You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you again, Jay. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Peace.